Fantastic. Isn't that awesome? Love that. When I saw that video last week, I actually cried. I did. Because I know what it feels like to be in a financial struggle and then to be set free of that. And so I just teared up and cried because I know what this couple is experiencing right now, freedom, not only financially but spiritually. It is such an honor for me to be able to stand in front of our great church, all seven campuses today and online. Welcome to you as well. Be able to introduce to you our, our speaker, our guest speaker, our guest today. Dave Ramsey has been so kind and generous to me personally. And he and his team have made a commitment to be here all weekend long, Saturday, Sunday, all the way through Monday night. They're doing an event all on his dime, which I love. <laughs> we love that about the Ramsey team. He's a New York Times bestseller several times over, uh, radio stations across our country. 600 of them, more than that, host the Dave Ramsey Show every single day. 4.5 million listeners daily. Uh, and he just got back from hunting pheasants in South Dakota, so you know he's not all that bad, right? Uh, thousands of you in our church and those who are lis listening in and are connected have gone through Financial Peace University and you've become financially free. And our prayer for the past two months has been that 10,000 more of you who are connected to our church in some way would go through Financial Peace University, would sign up for it this weekend and get your debt retired if that's a problem and get your savings start to going for college, retirement, building financial stability and to become generous someday if you're not already. Some of you would love to be generous but you can't because you're so financially strained. And that's no way to live. God has a better plan for your life. And so many of us are indebted to Dave Ramsey for that. I've read everything he's written. His latest book, Entre Leadership, is the best leadership book I have ever written. I've, I've read about, read, and I've read about, a, about 30 of them. And so it's right there at the top. My wife and I pat on our own financial habits, uh, according to the Bible, and to the teachings of Dave Ramsey. And I'm so, so pleased and we are so fortunate to have him here today. Would you please help me welcome from Nashville, Tennessee, Mr. Dave Ramsey. Come on up, Dave. Come on, man. All right. Oh, this guy. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, brother. Yep. Wow. You guys know that that man and Eagle Brook are iconic in the church world. What a, what a guy, amazing. Well, let's pray. God, you know I can do these talks by myself. They sure are better when you do them. Holy Spirit, you take this time. This is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. So, 36 years ago, my wife and I graduated from college, got married, and started off broke. How many of y'all started off broke? You remember, we ain't got money, honey, but we got love. Good thing, too, because we ain't got any money. We moved from Knoxville in East Tennessee, where we met and went to college, to Nashville, to Middle Tennessee, about 200 miles, and decided to start our lives off there. Our pre-marriage counseling consisted of none. We didn't do it. Bad idea. Those of you that are dating and gonna be engaged, pre-marriage counseling is essential. You will discover things you should discover prior to being married. So we get married, we hadn't talked about Jesus, and we hadn't talked about church, and we hadn't talked about any of that stuff. I was a beer-drinking, hell-raising, hillbilly, redneck kid. She knew what she was getting. It was right there on the table. <laughs> We've been married about two weeks, and my wife wakes up on Sunday morning and remembers that she's a Baptist. <laughs> this was not information I had previously. And apparently, it's a doctrinal thing. Once you're a Baptist, you're always a Baptist or something. I don't know how this works, but it's a big deal. And we're in Nashville, which is the buckle of the Bible Belt, right? I mean, there's more Baptists in Nashville than people. 
So she gets up and says, we're going to church Sunday morning. I said, we're not going to church. It's Sunday. <laughs> I'll be drinking football, drinking beer and watching football. That's what I do on Sunday. You're kidding me. Well, she apparently, I, I, there was a memo I was supposed to get somewhere, and I didn't get it, but that did not sit well with her. And she, you know, proceeded to try to convince me I should go to church. I'm not going to church. When they, you can't just spring this stuff on me after the fact. She gets mad, and she's crying, and she leaves and goes wandering around looking for a church. Didn't longer take her long to find her tribe. <laughs> she went in this little Baptist church, and, you know, after church, they came came down, the little elders prayed for her heathen husband. <laughs> and then one of my beer drinking buddies came by and he talked me into getting into one of these multi-level things so I could get rich. You know, those things where you make all your friends mad. And um, <laughs> he, uh, he talked, so, and we were just dumb. I mean, it was Daryl and his other brother, Daryl, y'all. It was just <laughs> bad. Like we would go to happy hour. There's a lot of beer in this story, but we would go to happy hour and then go make sales calls and couldn't figure out why we couldn't make sales. <laughs> just brilliant, you know? 22-year-old moron. And just dumb. And, and so we decide we need, there's things we need to know about this business that obviously we don't know because we don't have a yacht. You know, we don't have a huge house. And we're not worth $20 million. So some, we're doing something wrong because everybody else has got that apparently in this thing. So we need to go to one of the pepper alleys. So we drove from Nashville two hours south to Birmingham, Alabama to the Alabama Theater, which in my memory held 10,000 people, but I visited the other day. It's 800. <laughs> and we're sitting on the back row, which is where they put people like us, all day long listening to these guys tell us how we were going to be rich and all these things we could do and all this kind of stuff. And, and this, we had written down five things that if we could learn these five things on this Saturday, we could do the business. We could be big time. You know, we'd be able to live the dream. And, and, and the last guy to get up was the big dog. He was the big dog on the porch, you know, making all the money, the one we came to see. And, you know, they held up his check. You know, he's making like $435,000 a minute or whatever it was, you know, that's how they do that stuff. And, and so all this thing going on. And, and anyway, it was, he had credibility with us before he started talking. He could have just walked up there and said, boo, and we thought he was cool. But, but he actually, his talk, it was as if he had our five questions as his outline for his talk. So by the time he got finished, he owned us. Y'all know what I'm saying, say yes. I mean, he owned us. And then he says, and there's one more thing. And we went, no, we got our five. He said, there's one more thing. If you don't know God, and you're not been introduced to his son Jesus, you're gonna struggle in business because Jesus will teach you that people are important and business people who don't think people are important and treat them like a transaction instead of a relationship struggle in their business. I went, what do you say? <laughs> I think he's been talking to my wife. <laughs> God? You know, like, we need to go to church. And so we go back to the Hampton Inn or whatever it was, the, you know, the little Holiday Inn Express or what, I don't know, wherever it was, open up the the end table, the nightstand, and there's Gideon's Bible. So me and Daryl here, we open up the Gideon's Bible and we're gonna figure this thing out, only it's new, I mean, it's old King James. I mean, Shakespeare and Jesus, y'all. <laughs> there's no chance these two rednecks are getting through this, I'm just saying. <laughs> so we go through the thing, we've closed it up, I had no idea. I'd like to tell you that I got led to the Lord with the Gideon's Bible, I didn't, I couldn't understand a thing he said. But I did go home, I told my wife, I said, we're going to church, and she said, who are you and what have you done with my husband? <laughs> and we went to a couple of these churches. Y'all ever been to those churches where they're not having fun? People look like they were weaned on a pickle. <laughs> like, I don't wanna know your God. He's not fun. He must be mean. Unbelievable. You know, like if you're happy, you ought to notify your face. You know, I mean, oh my gosh. And we finally, we wandered in this little church, about 400 people. We're sitting on the back row, because that's what you do when you're checking out churches. You sit on the back row so you can escape, right? Get out of here before people talk to you about something. I don't want to get weird, awkward stuff going on, you know. Go to the visitor center. No. I'm just going home, yeah. And you know what you do when you're visiting. Y'all you know the truth, right? You just check out on the back. So anyway, we're on the back row, and these people are in there. 
And then this woman raised her hand during service. And then another guy raised his hand. These people were raising their hands like they knew the answer to some question. And then another woman raised two hands and she started swaying. And I told Sharon, I said, if they get out snakes, I'm out of here. <laughs> this is Tennessee, y'all. So, little 400 person church. We kept going back though. We, something kept pulling us there and we found out later it's called the Holy Spirit. And um, it was an old school church, the old pastor, there's 400 of us, he'd stand at the, 40 years ago, he'd stand at the back when you leave and sh everybody shakes his hand as he leaves and his wife, wife give, give you a big hug. She's a big squishy woman, she'd give you a big grandma hug, you know. And her hugs and that man being a man's man and not being a wimp, because I thought Christians were wimps, and, and being a real guy. And, and you know, the, those two led me to ending up on my knees and accepting Christ right there as a brand new 22 year old new husband. Didn't know what he was doing and it changed everything, y'all. Everything. I started, of course, I left that other thing and I started buying and selling real estate and I got rich. At least by a kid from Antioch, Tennessee standards. I ended up, by the time I was 26 years old, I had $4 million worth of real estate starting from nothing. A little over a million dollar net worth and that year I made $200,000 cash taxable income. This is 1984, 1985. That's a lot of money. I don't know what neighborhood, that's $20,000 a month. I don't know what neighborhood you grew up in, but in my neighborhood, we called that rich. We were having fun too, y'all. I mean, you know that car you always wanted? I always wanted a Jaguar, because the neighborhood I grew up in, you couldn't even spell Jaguar. It was exotic, right? So I got me a Jaguar, man. Within 90 days, baby, I was a Jaguar. <laughs> we went to Hawaii, rednecks in Hawaii. Oh, man. It was amazing. We liked it so much, you know what we did? We went back. We got Sharon sparkly things. They weren't big enough, so we got her some more. Sometimes I hear people say, all those rich people are miserable. Uh-uh. <laughs> now, I'm not here to tell you money will make you happy. Money will not make you happy. Money will only make you more of what you already are. It magnifies your life. If you're a, an angry, mean person and you get money, Lord, help those around you. If you are a kind and giving and generous person and you get money, you become a conduit for God for changing other people's lives with that money. You become what we call a philanthropist and you change entire communities, entire segments of society when you get money, if you're that kind of a person. You get money and you're crazy, you get crazier. You get money and you're a drug addict, you can afford the drugs. Yeah, it'll, it'll make you more of what you already are. And crazy's everywhere. Crazy's, it makes your family crazy too if you get money or expands the crazy that's already there. Y'all got crazy in your family, right? You know that. You know there's crazy in every family. And if you don't think there's crazy in your family, it's you. <laughs> some, of, some of these people put the fun in dysfunctional, don't they? Oh, man. So we were having a blast, but we, I had done stupid stuff with money. How many of y'all ever done something stupid? How many of you that didn't raise your hand have a problem with lying? <laughs> this is church, y'all, um, seriously. And, and I borrowed too much money. And the bank that we were working with got sold to another bank and a guy looks down in another city and says, there's a kid in Nashville, owes us millions of dollars on real estate. <sighs> Let's limit this relationship, which is banker talk for ruin his life. And without going into all the massive details, I wasn't even late on the payments. They just freaked out and had the ability to because I'm stupid. The paperwork I signed allowed them to just call our notes, quality of collateral clause, and all this other stuff. And so they just jerked the rug out from us. And we spent the next two and a half years of our life losing everything we owned. We were sued. We were sued so much that the guy with the sheriff's department were on a first name basis with the old boy. I mean, he's knocking on the front door, bringing those little pink lawsuit papers, right? And Sharon's like, hey, Harold, you want a cookie? I just made some. I mean, we're like, on, we, he's part of the family now. He's hanging out all the time, you know? And, and we were foreclosed on, and finally, with a brand new baby and a toddler and our marriage hanging on by a thread, we were bankrupt. Number one cause of divorce in North America today, money fights, money problems, money stress. Well, we were no different. I mean, we didn't get a divorce, y'all, but sometimes we just held on to each other to get a better grip. Y'all know what I'm talking about? 
She's from the hills of East Tennessee. Frying pan throwing there is an Olympic event. <laughs> I'd like to tell you I bounced back, but I didn't bounce back. I just went splat. I blamed everybody else. It was everybody's fault but mine. The bankers, the government, the IRS, probably my parents. It was, we blame everybody, right? You ever do something stupid, blame other people for your stupid? Turns out McDonald's does serve hot coffee. <laughs> Maybe you're not a victim, yeah. I don't know, it could be. It's just something to think about. Man. So I met God on the way up. I do everything backwards. I got to know him on the way down. Some of y'all been there. See, at the bottom, I had an I surrender all moment. And I'm not talking about a Baptist altar call that goes on till lunch. I'm talking about I really surrendered all. Jesus is not my co-pilot. He's the pilot. You, you're the Lord. What do you want me to do? How do I do this? I don't know how to be a daddy. I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to lead a company. I don't know how to handle money, obviously. I had a finance degree with letters and licenses after my name that says I'm supposed to know something about money. And there I sat broke, you. If you're really there, you can show me how to do this. And I began to open up his word because I didn't know what to do or how to do it. Now some of y'all grew up reading this, but I didn't. And I was trying to figure out how to be married and it says, submit yourselves one to another. Oh crud. <laughs> means I gotta dry dishes. You mean serve your wife? What are you talking about? I thought that was the other way around. My kids are reading through here. I'm gonna handle my kids this way, right? Dad, what's this rod stuff? <laughs> Come here, baby, I'll show you. <laughs> that one I know how to do. <laughs> 2,500 scriptures on handling money and possessions. Jesus talked more about money in the parables than he did love and grace put together. Isn't that interesting? Why? You that concerned about money? Jesus. No, he just knows that as he can get to us through our wallet, he's gonna get into our hearts and gets our attention that way. How we handle money is so reflective of who we are, our character, our spiritual walk. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And so there's five things, if you do these five things with money that we've learned, I could do a seminar, eight hours on each one of them, but we don't have time. They told me that I got 32 minutes after that, the Holy Spirit leaves. So, um, <laughs> and the other campuses shut off and all that stuff. So, but the, uh, <laughs> these five things, if you do these five things with money from the Bible, 100% of the time over the next 15 to 20 years, if you work and earn an income while you're doing these five things, you will build a level of wealth 100% of the time. Now, it's not like prosperity thing or something like that. It's like if you plant corn, guess what grows? Corn, ha <laughs> ha, it's not beans. You know, it's, nobody's shocked, right? As you sow, so shall ye reap. So what you do in your life, what you put in your life is what you're gonna get out, is what it amounts to. And if you do these five things, you'll win with money because they're Bible, it's straight up. Jesus says, do it, I love you, son. I've got a plan for you. It is not to bring you harm, but to give you hope. Remember Jeremiah 29, 11, right? And, and, and I can, you know, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desire comes, it is the tree of life. I've got a plan for you, kid. I love you. I'm crazy about you. Do this stuff. These five things, if you do them, you'll win. Number one is live on a written budget. Jesus said, which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest he get halfway up and is unable to finish. And all who see him begin to mock him and say, this man began to build and was unable to finish. Think about how much money you will earn in your working lifetime. For most of you, it is millions of dollars. From the time you're 20 to the time you're whatever working, you had all those years of income together, it's millions 
some of you tens of millions. If you're gonna build a $2 million house, a $5 million house, you would use a blueprint. You wouldn't walk up to the builder and go, just put it over there. Hope it works out. Here's two million, whatever you think, just do it. You don't do that, you have a plan. Zig Ziglar, my friend, used to say, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every single time. Winning is not an accidental act. It's an intentional act. No one wins the Super Bowl and after the game, they interview them and they go, so how did you win the Super Bowl? I don't know, I just got off the bus and here we were. No, since he was four years old, he's been running that route, turning and catching that ball. We'll watch it tonight when the Vikings win, right? You don't sound too sure. Okay. But I mean, it's, winning is an intentional act. You don't accidentally win at your marriage. If you've been married over 10 minutes, you know that. You don't accidentally have children that behave. Aren't wild animals. Some of these kids running around in restaurants. Are you raised by wolves? It's just, it's, not, it's an intentional act. Winning is not an accident. John Maxwell says a budget is people telling their money what to do instead of wondering where it went. On paper, on purpose, before the month begins. Number two is avoid debt. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. 100%. 100% of the references in scripture to debt are negative. Not one time does God bless his people using good debt. It's not in there, anywhere. It's not a sin. You can, it's not, certainly not a salvation issue. You can have a MasterCard and go to heaven. That's not the issue. The issue is your loving heavenly father who's crazy about you, has a plan for your life, says it's a curse. You're a slave, you're a fool. These are the things said all through scripture about debt. Now you can do what you wanna do, I'm just teaching you the Bible. You decide what you're gonna do. See, here's the thing, we come out of college, right? Had a little student loan debt and you know, got a little credit card and then I bought my wife a car I wanted. <laughs> and then you've been married 10 minutes and everybody's like, buy house, buy house, buy house. So broke people go buy houses. That's why they call them mortgage brokers. <laughs> and people come in my office, look like this all the time. They're like, dude, can you get me out? And yeah, but it's gonna hurt. We're gonna have to amputate the Tahoe. <laughs> you got stupid going on. Well, Sharon and I, we realize this is the truth. The borrower is slave to the lender. Okay, I got it. I really got it. I mean, I got a PhD in DUMB. I got it. I quit. I don't borrow money, ever, ever, for anything, ever again. I mean, we, we lit the candles, got the credit cards out, and gathered the children around and had a plastectomy party right there at the house. Plastic surgery, darling. I mean, discover. Freedom. <laughs> Citibank. What's in your wallet? Money. <laughs> American distress. <laughs> Give me a break. Oh, Victoria's Secret. They take cash. It's okay. You're all right. <laughs> it's amazing. You don't have any credit cards? No, I don't have any credit cards. That's my wallet. Green president's faces. Accepted everywhere, <laughs> just about. Four pieces of plastic, a debit card on my business. You have to have money in the account to use that. Y'all know how that works, right? A debit card on my personal, my driver's license, and my handgun carry permit. <laughs> oh, look at you. There's rednecks in Minnesota too, huh? Yeah, who knew? Yeah. yeah. I said that in California the other day. I about got arrested. Good to be back in America, but yeah. Oh, man, y'all are something. <laughs> I 
got a guy called me from Texas. He said, Dave, he called me on the radio show. You're going to kill me. I said, I'm not going to kill you. You're in Texas. I'm in Tennessee. I said, what'd you do? And he goes, my car payment. I said, your car payment? He said, my truck payment is huge. I said, how much is your truck payment? $769. Unbelievable. The average car payment in America is $504 over 84 months, according to the National Auto Dealers Association. If you invest $500 a month, from age 30 to age 70, or age, yeah, age, from age 30 to age 70, instead of giving it a car payment, you'll have $5.6 million in your Roth IRA. I hope you like your car. And this is what, you know, and it's going down in value like a rock, right? That's where Chevy got that, like a rock. And <laughs> this guy says his car, truck payment's $769. That's $769. If you lost your ever loving mind, I said, how much is your house payment. He goes, well, we live in a double wide. It's $550. <laughs> I said, dude, if your truck payment is bigger than your house payment, you might be a redneck. <laughs> wow. See, here's the interesting thing, biblically speaking and mathematically speaking. If you don't have any payments, you know what you have? Money. Ooh, that was deep, wasn't it? You can drive right past someone if you're not careful. Number three, foster high-quality relationships. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. You talk like the people you hang around with. You act like the people you hang around with. You read the same books and go to the same movies, the people you hang around with. If they read Scripture and are memorizing Scripture, you'll memorize Scripture. If they drop an F-bomb every 32 seconds, you'll use that as an adjective as well. You become who you hang around with. As a matter of fact, studies tell us that your income over the next 10 years will be the, within 10 to 15% of the average of your 10 closest friends' income over that same period of time. Some of you are going, oh, I need some new friends. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. I'm not saying be snobby to people. I'll be nice to anybody. I don't care who you are. I may be completely, I mean, you could be completely wrong and vote wrong and everything, and I'll still be nice to you. I'm not, I'll be nice to anybody, I don't care. But I'm not talking about the people you're nice to or not snubby to. I'm talking about your crew, the people that are influencing your life, they're in your inner circle. If all the guys you hang with at work are guys that go, take it easy, thank God it's Friday, oh God it's Monday. Little man can't get ahead. Eeyore is their spirit animal. <laughs> then you're gonna be just like that, aren't you? Before you know it, you're gonna be talking like that and walking like that. I was in New York the other day. You know, all those people have an accent. Isn't that interesting. Y'all think I got an accent. You become who you hang around with. Number four, save and invest. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. And the rest of that proverb says, a foolish man devours all he has. If you spend everything you make, the Bible says you're a fool. Ouch. Big red arrow pointing at me in the past. Fool, 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 fool. And you don't, you don't want to be a Bible fool. This is like a bad place to be. This is not like a greeting like, hey, fool. No, this is a, not a smart person, you know. So you don't want to be this kind of fool. Wise people save money. God said through his child Solomon, the wisest man that has ever lived, in the book of wisdom, that wise people save money. Choice food in biblical times, when Solomon would have written that, would have been reserved only for the aristocracy. There were only two classes of people. A very small percent were rich, and everybody else was dirt poor. Remember, two loaves and fishes was going to feed the kid for the whole day. Remember? It wasn't like, you know, lobster with buttered sauce. You know, <laughs> didn't come up, did it? The food you and I eat every day was considered <sighs> choice food. Oil is a sign of God's spirit. It was used to anoint kings, keep the Holy of Holies lamps lit in, lit in the Holy of Holies. And so wherever you went, you saw oil. It was God's spirit. And oil was used like a carafe of oil could be used in the open marketplace to do an exchange like we use green president's faces. In the house of the wise is wealth. You save money. Grandma said it. She said, save for a... Rainy day. Why? It's going to rain. Dave, you need to be positive. I'm positive. It's going to rain. 
There's gonna be a job layoff, a car wreck, something's gonna happen. Something's coming. This one I never understood. An unexpected pregnancy. Say what? <laughs> but something's coming, right? Something's gonna hit your house and boom, and you gotta have some money to catch it. That's your first thing you save for is for the emergency fund, the grandma's rainy day fund. And then you invest so that you can retire with dignity and hope, not hope the government, which is well known for its ability to handle money, will take care of you, <laughs> right? Wise people save money. Well, Dave, I live by faith. Then have the faith to read the book of wisdom that God wrote that says wise people save money. That's living by faith. If you plant corn, that's living by faith. You don't know if it's gonna rain. You can't make it rain. You don't know if the sun's gonna shine. You can't make the sun shine. Farmers understand this concept of having a partnership in your personal actions and what God does. These two things come together and it makes your life awesome. It's called blessings. I had a young man working for me and he was doing the wrong stuff. The wrong, he was doing the stuff he was doing the wrong way. And I said, dude, you gotta stop that. Do it this way. I came back a week later, he's still doing it wrong. I said, dude, you gotta stop that. Do it this way. I came back a week later, he's still doing it wrong. I'm like, buddy, we're gonna set you free in Jesus' name. <laughs> stop that. There's a right way and a wrong way. You're doing it the wrong way, do it the right way. And he looks at me and says, I'm not like you. And I said, okay, change. <laughs> God gives us this, the immutable dignity to make a decision to change. We can be doing the dumbest thing in the world and we can stop doing it on our own decision and go, that's it. I've had it. I'm gonna change. I'm gonna not treat my wife that way anymore. I'm gonna speak differently to my children. I'm gonna change. I'm gonna work while I'm at work. I'm gonna change. Because <laughs> the diligent prosper. Have you seen that scripture, you know? It doesn't say the lazy that steal and get by with what they can get by with, come late, leave early. That's not in there. They don't prosper. Stuff's not hard. Change. See, when you're going the wrong way and you stop of your own accord and you use the dignity that God has given you and you decide, I'm going to change. In Christianity, we call that repentance. Repentance means a turning away from something that was gonna bring harm to myself or others due to my behaviors. It's called sin when I'm doing that. I have the right to turn away from things that aren't working. I can just decide. See, if you decide to get on a budget and you decide to get out of debt using the budget and you don't have any payments and you're hanging out with people who are generous and people who are getting out of debt and don't wanna have any payments, then you'll be able to save money and you know what, you'll have money and then you'll be able to do the fifth one, which is be outrageously crazy generous. God loves a cheerful giver. It's really hard to be a cheerful giver when you're broke. But nobody plans to get out of debt hanging out with people on purpose to be broke. You end up, what I promised you at the beginning, building some wealth. Being generous starts with a tithe to your local church. That's what we evangelicals, we believe that. We've taught that. You know that's your baseline. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the spirit invades your life. You are generous. You are smiling. You're the person that opens the door for someone else. That's a generous person. They're not self-centered. They're other-centered. You see, what happens is a spiritual transformation going on here through the money. That's why Jesus talked about this so much. He didn't want your money. He wanted you. Let him be the Lord of your life. You got the opportunity to change and say, I'm gonna be wildly generous. Here, do this one, just try this one. Thanksgiving's coming. We've already agreed that you and I eat choice food. As a matter of fact, the meals that we have every day, particularly Thanksgiving at Grandma's house this year, is beyond what the average person has eaten in the history of man. We eat better most of us way better than we should. It's wonderful. So this Thanksgiving, I want you to do this. I want you to go to grandma's house. I want you to have a feast. I don't want you to be guilty about it. I don't want you to sit and go, oh, starving children. No, I want you to eat that food and enjoy it. But on your way, I want you to leave 30 minutes early and I want you to go to the little diner 
that's open all the time for breakfast. In the South, we have Waffle House. You guys got IHOP, right? Something like that. And I want you to pull, not out in the parking lot, pull right up front, because there's not gonna be anybody there. Park in front so your family can see inside. Leave the car running. If you want, you're not gonna be there long. Go inside, have a cup of coffee, and when you get ready to leave, you don't even drink the whole cup of coffee. I'm not there for the coffee. I want you to get three or four of these Uncle Benjamin Franklin C-note $100 bills. Let's say four of them. Slide them under that coffee cup and slip out right quick and go sit in the car and say, hey, kids, watch God show off. Let me tell you what she'll do when she comes up and finds them. Now, keep in mind, this lady works in this place on Thanksgiving morning. This is somebody who needs a job bad. She'll pick up those four. As soon as she picks them up, She thinks it's a trick because it's been so long since anything good's happened to her. Can't be real. And in a minute, it starts to settle in. This really is happening. It's Thanksgiving. The next thing she'll do is this. And even if she doesn't know God, even if she hadn't prayed in 20 years, 100% of the time, here's what she'll do. Because she just saw him through one of his children. She just saw him. She saw his face. That might be the rent money she was praying for that morning. It might be she doesn't even know how to pray anymore. She's been beat up so bad she doesn't know how to live. And then you know what she'll do? Ever seen a human do a Snoopy dance? I want you to go spend three or four hundred dollars on each other. Have some fun with it. But I want you to try something like that with some money. Because you'll never find more fun you can have with 300 bucks than that. That's about as fun as it gets. Oh, and by the way, your 12-year-old just watched this happen. You're changing your family tree. You're setting a standard. It's a different way we live in our house. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's what we're gonna do. You see, I know you. I don't know, a couple of you personally, but I know you. You work hard. You've tried to be smart, like I tried to be smart. Sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it does work. Some of you have done really well, some of you hadn't. Some of you are in the soup right now. You're doing all you can do. I believe in you. I've watched people just like you make a decision to change. I've watched people just like you put themselves in a position that they've lived like no one else so that later they can live and give like no one else. I'm proud of you. I'm honored to be one of you. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these folks. Lord, I I sense your love for them and You know I love them. And God, I just ask that you wrap your arms around them and that you speak clearly to them. Pull them where you want them to be. Don't push them. If I push them, you just reach over and pull them. You got a plan for them, God. I know you do. I've watched you do it so many millions of times. Thank you, Father, for being with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother. These, these are actual credit cards. I thought they might have been hotel cards or something, but he's got all kinds of these things. I guess people send them to him. Honestly, they do. They get debt-free, and they send him their credit cards, and they cut some up up here. So, 
last thing that Dave was talking about is his care and his love for you. And that's the reason we brought the Ramsey team in. We don't have a lot of guest speakers here at this church, and there's a reason for that. There's just so very few people that we trust and have a genuine care and love for people. And we love you. I love you as well. I don't know most of you, but we truly love all of you. Yeah. And what we want more than anything for, well, not more than anything, but one of the things we want for all of you is to be financially free. And I believe, just like Davis said, every single one of us can become financially free. It might take 20 years, might take 10 years, 20 years, but you can become financially free, get out of debt, start building resources so that you can be generous. Some of you want to be generous, but you can't. And God wants, you to, wants to free you from that. And so we're praying that 10,000 more of you online and all of our campuses will go through this course and let God do a work, a new work in your life. It's as much a spiritual issue as it is a financial or material issue. And we're praying that, that many of you will go through this uh, Financial Peace University. Here's how you do it at all campuses. There's three ways. Uh, you can text FPU555888. Access it that way or stop at our Next Steps area in all of our lobbies at our campuses. That's another way. Final ways, you can just get online, eaglebrookchurch.com slash FPU, and you can access it that way. But gang, thanks for coming. Let's all stand and for closing prayer and uh, be on our way today at all of our campuses and online. Thanks for joining us there as well. Let's pray together. Father, thanks so much for uh, the gift that we receive today, this, this amazing teaching from Dave and his team. God, thank you for the promise that we can become free, not, not only spiritually, but also financially in every other way. God, we all get distracted by whatever every, what we see other people have, and, and a lot of people are just in debt, living way beyond their means and heading for a crash, and we don't want to do that. So God, I pray that every single person here, including myself, will reevaluate how you want us to handle money for our sake and also for your sake. God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you want to set us free spiritually, financially, relationally, every other way. We love you, Lord Jesus. Help us to that end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for coming.